Disc 17, Interesting Times By Terry Pratchett Audiobook 9x18 They were talking in a strange language, so to too little Wang the Swang the speech was merely sounds, which went as follows. Where the hell are we? Somewhere under the palace, I'm sure. Look for another manhole in the ceiling, what? I'm fed up with pushing this damn wheelchair. It's me for a hot footbath after this, I'm telling you. You call this a way to enter a city? You call this a way to enter a city? Waist deep in water? We didn't enter a, wretched, city like this when I rode with Bruce the Hoon. You enter a, lovemaking, city by overrunning it with a thousand horsemen, that's how you take a city? Yeah, but there ain't room for em in this pipe. The sounds had a hollow, booming quality to them. With a kind of fascinated puzzlement too little Wong followed them, walking across the manicured gravel in an unthinking way that would have earned him an immediate tongue extraction from its original lover of peace and tranquility. Can we please hurry? I'd like us to be out of here when the cauldron goes off can we please hurry? I'd like us to be out of here when the cauldron goes off and I didn't really have much time to experiment with the fuses. I still don't understand about the cauldron, teach. I hope all those firecrackers will blow a hole in the wall. Right. So why ain't we there? Why are we in this pipe? Because all the guards will rush to see what the bands was. Right. So we should be there. No. We should be here, Cohen. The word is decoy. It's more civilized this way. Too little Wong pressed his ear to the ground. What's the penalty for entering the forbidden city again, teach? I believe it's a punishment similar to hanging, drawing, and quartering. So, you see, it would be a good idea if there was a very faint splashing. How are you drawn, then? I think your innards are cut out and shown to you. What for? I don't really know. To see if you recognize them, I suppose. What, like, yap, that's my kidneys, yap, that's my breakfast. How are you quartered? Is that, like, they give you somewhere to stay? I think not, from context. For a while there was no sound but the splash of six pairs of feet and the squeak squeak of what sounded like a wheel. Well, how are you hung? Excuse me. Her, 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 sorry, sorry. Two little Wong tripped over a two hundred year old bonsai tree and hit his two little Wong tripped over a two hundred year old bonsai tree and hit his head on a rock chosen for its fundamental serenity. When he came round, a few seconds later, the voices had gone. If there had ever been any ghosts. There were a lot of ghosts around these days. Too little Wong wished he had a few firecrackers to scatter around. Being master of protocol was even worse than trying to find a rhyme for orange blossom. Flares lit the alleys of Hung Hung. With the Red Army chattering behind him, Rin Swind wandered up to the wall of the Forbidden City. No one knew better than Rinswine that he was totally incapable of proper magic. He'd only ever done it by accident. So he could be sure that if he waved a hand and said some magic words the wall would in all probability become just a little bit less full of holes than it was now. It was a shame to disappoint Lotus Blossom, with her body that reminded Rinswine of a plate of crinkle-cut chips, but it was about time she learned that you couldn't rely on wizards. And then he could be out of here. What could Butterfly do to him if he tried and failed? And, much to his surprise, he found himself hoping that, on the way out, he could poke Herb in the eye. He was amazed the others couldn't spot him for what he was. This area of wall was between gates. The life of Hung Hung lapped against it like a muddy sea, there were stalls and booths everywhere. Rinswind had thought Ankh Morpork citizens lived out on the streets, 
but they were agoraphobes compared to the Hung Hun Gies. Funerals, with associated firecrackers, and wedding parties and religious ceremonies went on alongside, and intermingled with, the normal market activities such as free-form livestock slaughter and world-class arguing. Herb pointed to a clear area of wall stacked with timber. Just about there, great wizard, he sneered. Do not exert yourself unduly. A small hole should be sufficient. But there's hundreds of people around. Is that a problem to such a great wizard? Perhaps you can't do it with people watching. I have no doubt that the great wizard will astonish us, said Butterfly. When the people see the power of the great wizard they will speak of it forever, said Lotus Blossom. Probably, muttered Rinswind. Probably, muttered Rinswind. The cotter stopped talking, although it was only possible to notice this by watching their closed mouths. The hole left by their silence was soon filled by the babble of the market. Rinswind rolled up his sleeves. He wasn't even certain about a spell for blowing things up. He waved a hand vaguely. I should stand well back, everyone, said Herb, grinning unpleasantly. Quanti canicula ilia in finester, said Rinswind. Er, he stared desperately at the wall and, with that heightened perception that comes to those on the edge of terror, noticed a cauldron half hidden in the timber. There seemed to be a little glowing string attached to it. Er, he said, there seems to be. Having problems, said Herb, nastily. Rinswine squared his shoulders. He said. There was a sound like a marshmallow gently landing on a plate, and everything in front of him went white. Then the white turned red, streaked with black, and the terrible noise clapped its hands across his ears. A crescent-shaped piece of something glowing, scythed the top off his hat and embedded itself in the nearest house, which caught fire. There was a strong smell of burning eyebrows. When the debris settled Rinswine saw quite a large hole in the wall. Around its edge the brickwork, now a red-hot ceramic, started to cool with a noise like glinka glinka. He looked down at his soot-blackened hands. Gosh, he said. And then he said, all right and then he turned and began to say, how about that, then, but his voice faded when it became apparent that everyone was lying flat on the ground. A duck watched him suspiciously from its cage. Owing to the slight protection afforded by the bars, its feathers were patterned alternately natural and crispy. He'd always wanted to do magic like that. He'd always been able to visualize it perfectly. He'd just never been able to do it. A number of guards appeared in the gap. One, whose ferocity of helmet suggested that he was an officer, glared at the charred hole and then at Rinswind. Did you do this? he demanded. Stand back, shouted Rinswind, drunk with power. I'm the great wizard, I am. You see this ringer? Don't make me use it. The officer nodded to a couple of his men. The officer nodded to a couple of his men. Get him. Rinswine took a step back. I warn you. Anyone lays a hand on me, he'll be eating flies and hopping for the rest of his life. The guards advanced with the determination of those who were prepared to risk the uncertainty of magic against the definite prospect of punishment for disobeying orders. Stand back. This could go off. All right, then, since you force. He waved his hand. He snapped his fingers a few times. ER. The guards, after checking that they were still the same shape, each grabbed an arm. It may be delayed action, he ventured, as they gripped harder. Alternatively, would you be interested in hearing famous quotation, a uh, he said. His feet were lifted off the ground. Or perhaps not. Rinswind, running absent-mindedly in mid-air, was brought in front of the officer. On your knees, rebel, said the officer. 
I'd like to, but... I saw what you did to Captain Four White Fox. What? Who's he? Take, him, to, the... Emperor. As he was dragged off Rinswine saw, for one brief moment, the guards closing on the Red Army, swords flashing. A metal plate shuddered for a moment, and then dropped on the floor. Careful. I ain't used to being careful. Bruce the Hoon wasn't care. Shut up about Bruce the Hoon. Well, dang you two. What? Anyone out there? Cohen stuck his head out of the pipe. The room was dark, damp, and full of pipes and runnels. Water went off in every direction to feed fountains and cisterns. No, he said, in a disappointed voice. Very well. Everyone out of the pipe. There was some echoey swearing and the scrape of metal as Hamish's wheelchair was maneuvered into the long, low cellar. Mr. Savaloy lit a match as the horde spread out and examined their surroundings. Congratulations, gentlemen, he said. I believe we are in the palace. Yeah, said Truckle. We've conquered AF. A lovemaking pipe. What good is that? We could rape it, said Caleb hopefully. Hey, this wheel thing turns. What's a lovemaking pipe? What does this lever do? What? How about we find a door, rush out, and kill everyone? Mr. Savaloy closed his eyes. There was something familiar about this situation, and now he realized what it was. He'd once taken an entire class on a school trip to the city armory. His right leg still hurt him on wet days. No, 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 he said. What good would that do? Boy Willie. Please don't pull no, 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 he said. What good would that do? Boy Willie, please don't pull that lever. Well, I'd feel better, for one, said Cohen. Ain't killed anyone all day except a guard, and they hardly count. Remember that we're here for theft, not murder, said Mr. Savaloy. Now, please out of all that wet leather and into your nice new clothes. I don't like this part, said Cohen, pulling on a shirt. I like people to know who I was. Yeah, said Boy Willie. Without our leather and mail people just think we're a load of old men. Exactly, said Mr. Savaloy. That is part of the subterfuge. Is that like tactics, said Cohen. Yes. All right, but I don't like it, said old Vincent. Supposing we win. What kind of song will the minstrels sing about people who invaded through a pipe? An echoey one, said Boy Willie. They won't sing anything like that, said Cohen firmly. You pay a minstrel enough, he'll sing whatever you want. A flight of damp steps led to a door. Mr. Savaloy was already at the top listening. That's right, said Caleb. They say that whoever pays the piper calls the tune. But, gentlemen, said Mr. Savaloy, his eyes bright, whoever holds a knife to the piper's throat writes the symphony. The assassin moved slowly through Lord Hong's chambers. He was one of the best in Hung Hung's small but very select guild, and he certainly was not a rebel. He disliked rebels. They were invariably poor people, and therefore unlikely to be customers. His mode of movement was unusual and cautious. It avoided the floor, Lord Hong was known to tune his floorboards. It made considerable use of furniture and decorative screens, and occasionally of the ceiling as well. And the assassin was very good at it. When a messenger entered the room through a distant door he froze for an instant, and then moved through a distant door he froze for an instant, and then moved in perfect rhythm towards his quarry, letting the newcomer's clumsy footsteps mask his own. Lord Hong was making another sword. 
the folding of the metal and all the tedious yet essential bouts of heating and hammering were, he found, conducive to clear thinking. Too much pure cerebration was bad for the mind. Lord Hong liked to use his hands sometimes. He plunged the sword back into the furnace and pumped the bellows a few times. Yes, he said. The messenger looked up from his prone position near the floor. Good news, O oh Lord. We have captured the Red Army. Well, that good news, said Lord Hong, watching the blade carefully is for the change of color. Including the one they call the Great Wizard. Indeed. But he is not that great, O oh Lord, said the messenger. His cheerfulness faded when Lord Hong raised an eyebrow. Really? On the contrary, I suspect him of being in possession of huge and dangerous powers. Yes, O oh Lord. I did not mean. See that they are all locked up. And send a message to Captain Five Hong Man to undertake the orders I gave him today. Yes, O oh Lord. And now, stand up. The messenger stood up, trembling. Lord Hong pulled on a thick glove and reached for the sword handle. The furnace roared. Chin up, man. My lord. Now open your eyes wide. There was no need for that order. Lord Hong peered into the mask of terror, noted the flicker of movement, nodded, and then in one almost balletic movement pulled the spitting blade from the furnace, turned, thrust. There was a very brief scream and a rather longer hiss. Lord Hong let the assassin sag. Then he tugged the sword free and inspected the steaming blade. Hmm, he said. Interesting, he caught sight of the messenger. Are you still here? No, my lord. See to it. Lord Hong turned the sword so that the light caught it, and examined the edge. And, E.R. Shall I send some servants to clear away the, er, body? What, said Lord Hong, lost in thought. The body, Lord Hong. What body? Oh. Yes. See to it. The walls were beautifully decorated. Even Rinswind noticed this, though they went past in a blur. Some had marvelous birds painted on them or mountain scenes, or sprays of foliage, every leaf and bud done in exquisite detail with just a couple of brush strokes. Ceramic lions reared on marble pedestals. Vases bigger than rinswind lined the corridors. Lacquered doors opened ahead of the guards. Rinswind was briefly aware of huge, ornate and empty rooms stretching away on either side. Finally they passed through yet another set of doors and he was flung down on a wooden floor. In these circumstances, he always found, it was best not to look up. Eventually an officious voice said, What do you have to say for yourself? Eventually an officious voice said, What do you have to say for yourself, miserable louse? Well, I... Silence. Ah. So it was going to be that kind of interview. A different voice, a cracked, breathless and elderly voice, said, Where is the Grand? Vizier. He has retired to his rooms, O oh Great One. He said he had a headache. Summon him at, once. Certainly, O oh Great One. Rin swined, his nose pressed firmly to the floor made some further assumptions. Grand Vizier was always a bad sign, it generally meant that people were going to suggest wild horses and red-hot chains. And when people were called things like Oh Great One, it was pretty certain that there was no appeal. This is a, rebel, is it? The sentence was wheezed rather than spoken. This is a, rebel, is it? The sentence was wheezed rather than spoken. Indeed, O oh Great One. I think I would like a CLO, Sir Look. There was a general murmur, suggesting that a number of people had been greatly surprised, and then the sound of furniture being moved. 
Rinswine thought he saw a blanket on the edge of his vision. Someone was wheeling a bed across the floor. Make it, stand up. The gurgle in the paws was like the last bath water going down the plug hole. It sucked as wetly as an outgoing wave. Once again a foot kicked Rinswind in the kidneys, making its usual explicit request in the Esperanto of brutality. He got up. It was a bed, and quite the biggest Rinswind had ever seen. In it, swathed in brocades and almost lost in pillows, was an old man. Rinswind had never seen anyone look so ill. The face was pale, with a greenish pallor. Veins showed up under the skin of his hands like worms in a jar. The emperor had all the qualifications for a corpse except, as it were, the most vital one. Vital one. So, this is the new great wizard of, whom we have read so much, is, it, he said. When he spoke, people waited expectantly for the final gurgle in mid-sentence. Well, I... Rinswind began. Silence, screamed a chamberlain. Rinswind shrugged. He hadn't known what to expect of an emperor, but the mental picture had room for a big fat man with lots of rings. Talking to this one was a hair's breadth from necromancy. Can you show us some more, magic, great wizard? Rinswind glanced at the chamberlain. W. Silence. The emperor waved a hand vaguely, gurgled with the effort, and gave Rinswind another inquiring look. Rinswind decided to chance things. I've got a good one, he said. It's a vanishing trick. Can you, do it now? Only if everyone opens all the doors and turns their back. The emperor's expression did not change. The court fell silent. Then there was a sound like a number of small rabbits being choked to death. The emperor was laughing. Once this was established, everyone else laughed too. No one can get a laugh like a man who can have you put to death more easily than he goes to the lavatory. What shall we do with, you, he said. Where they? Grand, is vizier. The crowd parted. Rinswind risked a sideways squint. Once you were in the hands of a Grand Vizier, you were dead. Grand Viziers were always scheming megalomaniacs. It was probably in the job description. Are you a devious, plotting, unreliable madman? Ah, good, then you can be my most trusted minister. Ah, Lord. Hong, said the Emperor. Mercy suggested Rinswind. Silence, screamed the Chamberlain. Tell me, Lord. Hong, said the ancient emperor. What would be the punishment for a, foreigner, entering the forbidden city? Removal of all limbs, ears and eyes, and then allowed to go free, said Lord Hong. Rinswind raised his hand. First offense, he said. Silence. We find, generally, that there is no second offense, said Lord Hong. What is this person? I like him, said the Emperor. I think I shall, keep him. He makes me, laugh. Rinswind opened his mouth. Silence, screamed the Chamberlain, perhaps unwisely in view of current thinking. E.R. Could you stop him shouting silence, every time I try to speak? Rinswind ventured. Certainly. Great wizard, said the emperor. He nodded at some guards. Take the chamberlain, away and cut his, lips off. Great one, I. And his ears, also. The wretched man was dragged away. A pair of lacquered doors slammed shut. There was a round of applause from the courtiers. Would you, like to watch him eat, them, said the emperor grinning happily. It's T.R.E., Mendes fun. Ah ha ha ha, said Rinswind. A good decision, lord, 
said Lord Hong. He turned his head towards Rin Swind. To the wizard's immense surprise, and some horror too, he winked. Oh great one, said a plump courtier, dropping to his knees, bouncing slightly, and then nervously approaching the emperor, I wonder if perhaps it is entirely wise to be so merciful to this foreign dev. The emperor looked down. Rinswind would have sworn that dust fell off him. There was a gentle movement among the crowd. Without anyone apparently doing anything so gross as activating their feet, there was nevertheless a widening space around the kneeling man. Widening space around the kneeling man. Then the emperor smiled. Your concern is well, received, he said. The courtier risked a relieved grin. The emperor added, however, your presumption is not. Kill him slowly, over several, days. Arg. Yes in, deed. Lots of boiling, oil. An excellent idea, a oh lord, said Lord Hong. The emperor turned back to Rin Swind. I am sure the great wizard is my friend, he suctioned. Ah ha ha ha, said Rin Swind. He'd been in this approximate position before, gods knew. But he'd always been facing someone. Well, usually someone who looked like Lord Hong, not a near corpse who was clearly so far round the bend he couldn't Lord Hong, not a near corpse who was clearly so far round the bend he couldn't poke sanity with a long pole. We shall have such, fun, said the Emperor. I read, all about you. Ah ha ha ha, said Rinswind. The Emperor waved a hand at the court again. Now I will retire, he said. There was a general movement and much ostensible yawning. Clearly no one stayed up later than the Emperor. Emperor, said Lord Hong wearily, what will you have us do with this great wizard of yours? The old man gave Rinswind the look a present gets around the time the batteries have run out. Put him in the special, dungeon, he said. Four. Now. Yes, Emperor, said Lord Hong. He nodded at a couple of guards. Rinswind managed a quick look back as he was dragged from the room. The Emperor was lying back in his movable bed, quite oblivious to him. Is he mad or what, he said. Silence. Rinswind looked up at the guard who'd said that. A mouth like that could get a man into big trouble around here, he muttered. Lord Hong always found himself depressed by the general state of humanity. It often seemed to him to be flawed. There was no concentration. Take the Red Army. If he had been a rebel the Emperor would have been assassinated months ago and the country would now be aflame, except for those bits too damp to burn. But these? Despite his best efforts, their idea of revolutionary activity was a surreptitious wall poster saying something like unpleasantness to oppressors when convenient. They had tried to set fire to guardhouses. That was good. That was proper revolutionary activity, except for the bit where they tried to make an appointment first. It had taken Lord Hong some considerable effort to see that the Red Army appeared to achieve any victories at all. Well he'd given them the great wizard they so sincerely believed in. They had no excuse now. And by the look of him, the wretch was as craven and talentless as Lord Hong had hoped. Any army led by him would either flee or be slaughtered, leaving the way open for the counter-revolution. The counter-revolution would not be inefficient. Lord Hong would see to that. But things had to be done one step at a time. There were enemies everywhere. Suspicious enemies. The path of the ambitious man was a nightingale floor. One wrong step and it would sing out. It was a shame the great wizard would turn out to be so good at locks. Lord Tang's men were guarding the prison block tonight. Of course, if the Red Army were to escape, no blame at all could possibly attach to Lord Tang. 
Lord Hong risked a little chuckle to himself as he strode back to his suite. Proof, that was the thing. There must never be proof. But that wouldn't matter very long. There was nothing like a fearsomely huge war to unite people, and the fact that the great wizard, that is, the leader of the terrible rebel army, was an evil foreign troublemaker was just the spark to light the firecracker. And then, Ankh Morpork urinating dog. Hung Hung was old. The culture was based on custom, the alimentary tract of the common water buffalo, and base treachery. Lord Hong was in favor of all three, but they did not add up to world domination, and but they did not add up to world domination, and Lord Hong was particularly in favor of that, provided it was achieved by Lord Hong. If I was the traditional type of Grand Vizier, he thought as he sat down before his tea table, I'd cackle with laughter at this point. He smiled to himself, instead. Time for the box again? No. Some things were all the better for the anticipation. Mad Hamish's wheelchair caused a few heads to turn, but no actual comment. Undue curiosity was not a survival trait in Hung Hung. They just got on with their work, which appeared to be the endless carrying of stacks of paper along the corridors. Cohen looked down at what was in his hand. Over the decades he'd fought with many weapons. Swords, of course, and bows and spears and clubs and, well, now he came to think of it, just about anything. Except this. I still don't like it, said Truckle. Why are we carrying pieces of paper? Because no one looks at you in a place like this if you are carrying a piece of paper, said Mr. Savaloy. Why? What? It's... a kind of magic. I'd feel happier if it was a weapon. As a matter of fact, it can be the greatest weapon there is. I know, I've just cut myself on my bit, said Boy Willie, sucking his finger. What? Look at it like this, gentlemen, said Mr. Savaloy. Here we are, actually inside the Forbidden City, and no one is dead. Yes. That's what we're, dunging complaining about, said Truckle. Mr. Savaloy sighed. There was something in the way Truckle used words. It didn't matter what he actually said, what you heard was in some strange way the word he actually meant. He could turn the air blue just by saying socks. The door slammed shut behind Rinswind, and there was the sound of a bolt shooting into place. The Empire's jails were pretty much like the ones at home. When you want to incarcerate such an ingenious creature as the common human being, you tend to rely on the good old-fashioned iron bar and large amounts of stone. It looked as though this well-tried pattern had been established here for a very long time. Well, he'd definitely scored a hit with the Emperor. For some reason this did not reassure him. The man gave Rinswine the distinct impression of being the kind of person who is at least as dangerous to his friends as to his enemies. He remembered Noodle Jackson, back in the days when he was a very young student. Everyone wanted to be friends with Noodle but somehow, if you were in his gang, you found yourself being trodden on or chased by the watch or being hit in fights you didn't start, while Noodle was somewhere on the edge of things, laughing. Besides, the Emperor wasn't simply at death's door but well inside the hallway, admiring the carpet and commenting on the hat stand. And you didn't have to be a political genius to know that when someone like that died, scores were being settled before he'd even got cold. Anyone he'd publicly called a friend would have a life expectancy more normally associated with things that hover over trout streams at sunset. Rinswind moved aside a skull and sat down. There was the possibility of rescue, he supposed, but the Red Army would be hard put to it to rescue a rubber duck from drowning. Anyway, that'd put him back in the clutches of Butterfly, who terrified him almost as much as the Emperor. He had to believe that the gods didn't intend for Rinswind, after all his adventures, to rot in a dungeon. 
No, he added bitterly, they probably had something much more inventive in mind. What light reached the dungeon came from a very small grill and had a second-hand look. The rest of the furnishing was a pile of what had possibly once been straw. There was a gentle tapping at the wall. Once, twice, three times. Once, twice, three times. Rinswind picked up the skull and returned the signal. One tap came back. He repeated it. Then there were two. He tapped twice. Well, this was familiar. Communication without meaning, it was just like being back at Unseen University. Fine, he said, his voice echoing in the cell. Fine. T.R., S. Prisoner. But what are we saying? There was a gentle scraping noise and one of the blocks in the wall very gently slid out of the wall, dropping onto Rinswine's foot. Arg! Arg! What big hippo, said a muffled voice. What? Sorry. What? You wanted to know about the tapping code. It's how we communicate between cells, you see. One tap means. Excuse me, but aren't we communicating now? Yes, but not formally. Prisoners are not, allowed, to talk, the voice slowed down, as if the speaker had suddenly remembered something important. Ah, yes, said Rinswind. I was forgetting. This is... Hung hung. Everyone, obeys, the rules, Rinswind's voice died away too. Rinswine's voice died away too. On either side of the wall there was a long, thoughtful silence. Rinswine. To flower. What are you doing here, said Rinswine. Rotting in a dungeon. Me too. Good grief. How long has it been, said the muffled voice of To flower. What? How long has what been? What? How long has what been? But you, why are, you wrote that damn book? I just thought it would be interesting for people. Interesting. Interesting. I thought people would find it an interesting account of a foreign culture. I never meant it to cause trouble. Rinswind leaned against his side of the wall. No, of course, to flower never wanted to cause any trouble. Some people never did. Probably the last sound heard before the universe folded up like a paper hat would be someone saying, What happens if I do this? It must have been fate that brought you here, said To Flower. Yes, it's the sort of thing he likes to do, said Rinswind. You remember the good times we had? Did we? I must have had my eyes shut. The Adventures Oh, them. You mean hanging from high places, that sort of thing. Rinswind. Yes. What? I feel a lot happier about things now you're here. That's amazing. Rinswind enjoyed the comfort of the wall. It was rust rock. He felt he could rely on it. Rely on it. Everyone seems to have a copy of your book, he said. It's a revolutionary document. And I do mean copy. It looks as though they make their own copy and pass it on. Yes, it's called Sami's Dot. What does that mean? It means each one must be the same as the one before. Oh, dear. I thought it would just be entertainment. I didn't think people would take it seriously. I do hope it's not causing too much bother. Well, your revolutionaries are still at the slogan and poster stage, but I shouldn't think that'll count for much if they're caught. Oh, dear. How come you're still alive? I don't know. I think they may have forgotten about me. That tends to happen, I don't know. I think they may have forgotten about me. That tends to happen, you know. It's the paperwork. 
someone makes the wrong stroke with the brush or forgets to copy a line. I believe it happens a lot. You mean that there's people in prison and no one can remember why? Oh, yes. Then why don't they set them free? I suppose it is felt that they must have done something. All in all, I'm afraid our government does leave something to be desired. Like a new government. Oh, dear. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.